So there's a lot of things in here for you as well. Um, but we want to, I just want to take a moment to speak to our mothers. Before we get into this thing, I wanted to take a little uh, observation or poll in the church. See, I believe all throughout my life, my mom has taught me so many different things. And she, she was a great teacher, just like all of you are. But you don't realize it until you look back and you look at these things. So I want to take a little uh, poll here. I'm going to show you a quote and I want you to raise your hand if you've ever said this. So for example, it's the first one. Because I said so, that's why. Who said that one? Yeah, yeah. So whether you realize it or not, you're teaching them philosophy through logic, right? So congratulations, you're a teacher. Oh, let's get the next one. You're just like your father. Who said that one? Right? Uh, you're teaching them biology about genetics. You're te you don't even know you're teaching your kids all of this. It's incredible. Uh, what about this one? You keep laughing and I'll give you something to cry about. <laughs> Anybody? Right? Uh, through this, you're, teach <laughs> you're teaching uh, English Lit 101. This is irony. I mean, yeah. Uh, what about this one? You sit there until you finish all your food. I don't care if it takes all night. I've said this one a few times. All right, this is, this is about endurance and perseverance. This is physical education. So congratulations, you've been teaching your kid. What about this one? You just wait until your father gets home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a few of you, all right. Again, another physical education. It's about anticipation and how to deal with stuff. Uh, what about this one? It looks as if a tornado swept through your room. Wow, yours went fast, okay teaching them science, right? This is about the weather, tornadoes. Uh, what about this one? I brought you into this world. I can take you out. Who said that one? Okay, that's another science. This is a circle of life. Uh, I got a couple more for you. How about this one? There's a million of less fortunate children in this world who don't have a wonderful mom like you do. Who said that one? A couple. That's, that's Bible class. That's blessings, right? You're teaching them Bible. And then a last one, this is a good one. You better pray to God this stain comes out of this carpet. <laughs> you got that one? Right, that's another Bible class. You're teaching them about prayer, about connecting. So congratulations, you're all teachers. If you, if you didn't raise your hand, you're a terrible mom. We're gonna say you're not teaching your kids nothing. Uh, I'm just kidding. So you're teaching them all kinds of stuff, which I thought it was kind of funny. I, I like look back and realize my mom said a lot of those directly to me too. Um, but uh, today I really wanted to get to, actually I want to capture a lot about my mom, uh, who was an incredible mom. I do miss her every day. I love her very much. I'm not going to get emotional or anything. I celebrate where she's at. Uh, I celebrate the memories we have. But so when, I, when my mom passed away, uh, I refused to let anybody else do the service. I said, I, Lord brought me to this place in my life, and no one else can do her justice like I can. So... I, I did her service, and then when I began to prepare for it, I really prayed about what to say about my mom. So my mom was not one of those people that would ever get behind a pulpit. She was never one to be in the middle of a large crowd. In fact, she was very quiet. She was very to herself. Uh, if you go look back at her life in, in a worldly perspective, she didn't accomplish a much according to the world. Right? She didn't have a great job. She didn't do all these things. And the more I prayed about it, the more I realized who my mom was. She was an incredible mother. And I honor her for that. And, and I, as I begin to uh, pr pr prepare for that message, I, I've thought about the ultimate example for her. And a lot of times we, we hear this example of, you know, if you throw a pebble into a pond and it creates ripples. And in our life, we need to create ripples that last. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized my mom isn't a pebble, right? She didn't create a large splash in this world. But when I look at a pond outside of the ripples, I watch, and I, we were, Addie and, I, Addie and I were out there fishing the other day, and I, it just reminded myself, but there were so many ripples, and I'm thinking about where are those coming from, but it's the wind. You don't hear the wind, you don't see the wind, you just realize it's creating something and creating an effect in that pond. And when I created or started her message, that's when I realized that's who my mom was. She was quiet. 
she was still, but she created so many ripples by her love for myself, for my sister, and for my brother. And because of that love, I'm the man I became. And my sister is a woman that she became, and my brother as well. We all have very different paths and, and jobs and stuff, but we still love well because I, my mom loved us well. And so I wanted to talk today about ripples. Like, what ripples are we creating in our lives as mothers, as fathers, as human beings? What example are we leaving? And to do that, I want to check out the story of Hannah in 1 Samuel 1. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. If you don't, I encourage you to get one. They're pretty good. Spoiler alert, Jesus comes back to life. Um, yeah, it's a great book. It's a great resource. If you're serious about your relationship with the Lord, then you need to be serious about his word. Uh, and yes, you can get it on your phone, and there are apps, and I do use those as well. But there's something about having a physical Bible. There really is. Uh, and for me personally, I want to be able to write notes and then one day hand them my children. So if I pass, they can still hear my heart through the notes on the page. So uh, anyways, so in first thing I said, the story of Hannah, what I like, really like about the story of Hannah, and this is what we're going to be talking about, it is a very real story. And as we read this, you're going to see it as I revert back to some of the beginning of it. You're going to see it, but it's very real. And t keep in mind, this is around 1100 B.C., so this is roughly 3100 years ago. But yet, as we read it, it's so relevant to marriage and relationships and, and a mother's heart that it's very easy to attach and put ourselves in this place. But you have to keep in mind in the surroundings and in the, the context of this place in Hannah's life, there seemed to be this leadership vacuum. The people were trying so hard to dictate their own power and becoming less interested in the desires of God. With no moral standards to draw the lines right or wrong, it leaves a void in society. This is starting to sound familiar, right? If you think about our own culture, the result there is an intolerance to any morality, which makes Hannah's heart and spiritual legacy that much more impressive. Because in this time, here's the reality. Women were not, didn't speak. Women sit in the background. Their only responsibility, according to the culture, was to have kids and continue to reproduce so that they can give back to the husbands. Right? You didn't hear their voice. You didn't, they were not to be heard. This is why Hannah's story and then Ruth and so many in the Old Testament, uh, even in the New Testament coming into it, is so incredible because these ladies defied the culture and continue to speak out for the Lord. That's why I truly love this. But I do want to say in a preface this, that God, that was not God's intention for the culture. It was not God's intention for you to be silenced, women. For you to be quiet, now there are times that we all need to be quiet, right? But it wasn't his intention for you to be left to the side. Because if you really look, look into the creation of the world, at the very beginning of Genesis 1, you see the order of creation. So you see God created the heavens and the earth, and it was what? Good, right? You see light, and it was good. Waters and land, it was good. And the story continues, and he created, the only time he said that it wasn't good is when he created all of this, and then he created man, Adam, and he said there's something missing. It's the only time in the creation he said it wasn't good, it was the absence of the woman. And then the very last thing he created was you. So the thing that, not the thing, the person that completed his whole picture and his whole vision was you which gives you so much value and worth in this world. And, then, and unfortunately, be, uh, after that, and this is what we do in society, what God starts, uh, man often shifts because it's what we do, unfortunately. And the culture shifted, the human condition kicked in, uh, and then man began to alter. We constantly compromise his desires because of our wants and convenience. And because of that, uh, men became louder and women became less loud because of the culture. And, and I'm not going to get on this whole uh, women pride thing and, 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 and run the... Uh, the, the men are the spiritual leaders, which they are, and they are called to be, and, and we should. But I just want to let you know that you do have a voice. But because of culture, things happen, and, and, and this is where Hannah was, and this is why it's amazing to look at Hannah's story and realize that she didn't care about the culture, 
right? The culture shift, the women began to lose their voice. But then you see stories like Hannah that prove the value of a voice spoken for God. So let's look at this. First Samuel 1, and we're going to start in verse 19. Uh, I have a lot of scriptures up there, but I'm going to skip to 19. Let me give you a little understanding of what's happening. So there was this guy named Elkanah, right? He had two wives, Peninnah, or Peninnah and uh, Hannah. We're not going into why uh, they had two wives and why would you ever want two wives and all that kind of stuff. But uh, in the culture, that was perfectly normal. Um, and so he had two wives, and the reality is Peninnah was able to have kids, and Hannah was not. Hannah struggled with that. Peninnah was kind of mean and rough and bully, bullied her and said, hey, uh, I have kids, you don't, you're a joke, I'm worthy, you're not, all that kind of stuff. All those things that uh, in, the, in the case of these situations, we tend to tell ourselves, and then when somebody else tells us, it really throws us down a loop. And so Hannah had a really rough time with this. In fact, in the first part of first Samuel, you can see her, she was crying a lot. She was mourning, and then she would talk to the Lord, and she finally made a vow to the Lord, said, Lord, if you give me a son, uh, I'll give him right back to you to honor you. And then so we we'll fast forward to verse 19, and then we'll pick up and read the rest of this. The next morning, Elkanah and Hannah got up early to worship before the Lord. That's very important. Afterward, they returned home to Ramah. Then Elkanah with, was, was intimate with his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. After some time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel because she said, I requested him from the Lord. When Elkanah and all his household went up to make the annual sacrifice and his vow offering to the Lord, Hannah did not go and explain to her husband, after the child is weaned, I'll take him to appear in the Lord's presence and to stay there permanently. Her husband Elkanah replied, do, you, do what you think is best and stay here until you are we, you're weaned him. May the Lord confirm your word. So Hannah stayed there and nursed her son until she weaned him. When she had weaned him, she took, her, she took with her to Shiloh as well as a three-year-old bull, half a bushel of flour, and a clay jar of wine. Though the boy was still young, she took him to the Lord's house at Shiloh. Then they slaughtered the bull and brought the boy to Eli. Please, my Lord, she said, as surely as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this boy, and since the Lord gave me what I asked for, I now give the boy to the Lord. For as long as he lives, he is given to the Lord. Then he worshiped the Lord there. Incredible story. What a great gift it is to become a mother or father. Right? A lot of us in this room understand this but what a great responsibility right she prayed for it god delivered and now she has a responsibility to own up to her vow but it's such a responsibility to shape and mold and direct this child and i, I just remember when addie was born my first daughter they put her on her little bed the nurses and doctors and they left the room and i'm sitting there now what where's the owner manual in this thing right i was still waiting for it because it's, it's a lot. You, 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 it really comes over you that you have this huge responsibility to take over this child. And so it's here, and you're like, and you know what? To be perfectly honest, if our kids only knew that we have no idea what we're doing, uh, they would probably take over the world. I'm sure they would. Because in reality, because there's a lot of responsibilities, we're figuring it out as we go, uh, and then nothing's ever the same between two children, it's all different, and you're just praying to God that he gives you some kind of wisdom to get through this day, right? But I think that's exactly where God wants us. He wants us in that place where we rely on him for the wisdom to guide and direct and teach our children. And through God's help, we can learn to honor him with everything he has entrusted in our lives, and that includes our children. And so here's Hannah's story. If we look at her story and look at the waves or the ripples that she's creating, I think we can all learn something from this. But the very first ripple that she created is that Hannah gave herself to the Lord. Hannah gave herself, her full self to the Lord. Her greatest strength as a woman and as a mother was her selflessness which was also parallel, if you really think about it, to the greatest characteristic of Jesus. She was selfless. Yes, in the first beginning of chapter 1, you see her crying a lot, crying out to the Lord, and you think, well, that's a selfish prayer. But in reality, in this time, when they had kids, it was to honor their husband. 
and to honor God. And that's what she did with her son. So it's pretty selfless of her to give up her son and give up her self in that sense. But she was so selfless. And this sounds so easy to do as a human being to be selfless, but it's one of the harder characteristics to embody. Because we live in a culture that is very prideful and very about self and, and what you want to do, but the Lord is requiring of us to be selfless, and Hannah is an embodying this. Hannah offers up God something of her, or offers God something of herself that evidently moved God her, God's heart. It was her vulnerability, right? Her vulnerability, she bowed before God with her hands up high, but she didn't just do this in church. It became her lifestyle, right? We're very good about worshiping God in here, holding our hands high, and then once we leave, we still meet, we're still very selfish and do things how we want them. But Hannah, outside of the body of Christ, walked and lived her life in a selfless way to honor God. I'm going to say something here that I'm probably going to re regret, which happens a lot. Uh, women, it's okay to cry. It is okay to cry. I told my wife I was going to say that, and she said, they don't need your permission. <laughs> uh, truth, truth. But we see Hannah's story, and we might not understand it. You know, what's funny, you have to go back and look at chapter 1. Look at this place in, at the beginning of the story when she was crying a lot. I think in verse 7, year after year, when she went up to the Lord's house, her rival taunted her in this way. Hannah would weep and would not eat. Hannah, why are you crying? Her husband asked. Why won't you eat? What are you, what are you so troubled about? This is, the, this is it right here. This is why I say it's so real. How many times your wife cried and you're like, what is wrong with you? I don't know. I don't know how to help you. Why are you crying? And if they, if we still haven't figured it out 3,100 years later. There's no hope. There's just no hope, all right? Just give her your shoulder, right? Yeah, she was crying. So it's okay. It's okay to cry. Um, the wisest man who ever lived said in Ecclesiastes 3, 4, there's a time to weep and there is a time to laugh. There's a time to mourn and there's a time to dance. And I believe he had women in mind when he wrote this because as a man, I read this and it's very confusing, Right? But there is a time to cry. I'm not saying you shouldn't cry, man. There is a time for that as well. But I think about this verse, and I think Solomon also should have defined a little bit more what the timeline of these emotions are. Because the reality is, if I see my wife crying, and in that same moment she starts to smile uh, or laugh, and in that same moment begins to cry again and then start dancing, you better believe I'm going to load up my kids and leave for a little bit because there's something wrong with my wife. Yeah, there's a season and time for it, and it's okay. Maybe not all four of those things at one time, but it is okay to cry. It's okay to be vulnerable. Here's the key component of all of this right here. What did she do with her tears? She gave them to the mercy of the Lord. Right? Hannah got up after they ate and drank in Shiloh. This is verse 9. Hannah prayed to the Lord and wept with many tears. If you're going to cry, do it first on the shoulder of the Lord. And she was persistent in this. She was persistent in her vulnerability. She continued to go to the Lord with her desires. She knew she was meant for something more, and she kept going to the Lord for them. She was persistent in them. She laid them down, and if you want to see her heart unfold, then read her prayer in the next chapter, in chapter 2. You actually see it all unfold in her actual words. And it's beautiful, but you can also see her priorities. It wasn't about self. It was about the Lord. She was giving herself to the Lord. And you know what? She also offers her commitment to the Lord. She didn't give God her sloppy seconds. She gave her her full self, her full commitment, and she saw it through. I mean, how many times have you been in a bind and you're like, oh, Lord, I'll do whatever you want if you get me out of this bind. And he does it, and then we forget about it. We forget about our vows and our commitment. He says, Lord, I, Lord, I'm just going to be committed to you this week, and I'm going to work on it. I'm going to read scripture every day, and by day three, you're done with it, right? We need to honor him with our commitments. She spoke out when God desired for her to do, and she acted out when God desired for her to do because she committed to the Lord. Uh, we just spoke Wednesday about how do we know when to act and when to be still. So there's this um, 
mom and daughter who decided they wanted to go and get their certification for CPR. So they went and took the class, right? And then once they left, the mom of the two, and she walked out of that class like she was superwoman. Like she's ready to go. She's, now it's her mission to save the world because now she's certified. Big chest, she's ready to go. She's ready to take on the world. So a week later, they were in the mall, and she looked over, and there was a large crowd around the, somebody that was laying on the ground. And so in her mind, this is what I've lived for this moment. So she ran into that crowd. She started pushing people. I'm CPR certified. I'm CPR certified. I'm going to get this. I'm ready to go. And she starts getting in the crowd and a police officer grabbed her and held her back. She's like, no, you don't understand. I'm CPR, CPR certified. And the cop said, no, you don't understand. I'm trying to arrest this man. Yeah. There's a time to be still and a time to act. Right. And the more vulnerable you are with the Lord, the more he speaks that into you so that you can realize it. In fact, Wednesday, that was the thing that we come up to with that answer is that the closer you get to the Lord, the more you're able to discern those times and those moments that we need to be still and that we need to act. But that requires more vulnerability on your side to be real with the Lord. This wisdom guides us as we raise our children. When to correct, when to allow them to fall, when to pick them up. It all begins with a commitment to the Lord and trusting his guidance. She committed her full self to God. A little sidebar. This is what I call the ripple reflection. Uh, as we move to the side, ripples aren't always caused by loud splashes. Like I talked about my mom, how she wasn't a big splash. She was the wind that quietly, you know, blew over the water to cause ripples. Some people were created to make big splashes, but... It doesn't always have to be that way. For, for example, pastor is a big splash kind of guy, right? We all agree with that. That's who he is. He's gifted in that way. When he comes in the room, you know he's there, right? He doesn't come quietly anywhere. And that's who he is. That's his gifting. That's his ability. And he's, he's moved so many mountains in this world because the Lord has put that on him. Pastor Joseph, not so much. Right? That's not who I am. And you know what? We struggle with that, that comparison at times. Like, you know, I, I wish I could be like that and be that, but that's not who I am. So I embrace how God created me. And even though I'm behind a pulpit talking to you, I'm outside of that, I'm a pretty quiet person most of the time. Right? But I make the ripples by the relationships I've, I have uh, in this world. And so it's okay to be quiet and be still and to be who you are. You don't have to be loud to make ripples in this world. Love will do that for you. Love will create these ripples in your gifting and abilities. So we have to embrace that. Hannah did not make a big splash, but her ripples lasted longer than the splash ever could. In fact, no, we'll go there in a second. The second ripple that we see in Hannah's life is Hannah gave her marriage to the Lord. And this is so important. This is why this message connects with everybody, almost everybody in this room. This one, you can see yourself, if you're not married, don't have any kids, well, then the first category, the first ripple is very important. You give yourself unto the Lord. If you're married with no kids, then you add this one too. Does your marriage create ripples for the Lord? Because you look right here in verse 21 and through 23 uh, that we just read. She's saying to her husband that I need to go do this. And, and in fact, I'll just go ahead and read it. Um, when Elkan and all his household went up to make the annual sacrifice for his vow to offering, offering the Lord, Hannah did not go and explain to her husband, after the child is weaned, I'll take him to appear in the Lord's presence and to stay there permanently. Her husband, Elkanah, replied, do what you think is best. Why is that so important in this story? Because I just told you this is a culture that doesn't listen to women. So this says a lot about their marriage that her husband would say, whatever you think is best, I will stand behind you. This is so valuable because in a relationship, obviously there is something that the Lord is doing in this relationship. And again, he respected her because the Lord taught him to do so. He placed value in their marriage and trusted her with their own children. For him to say that in that culture is a huge thing. 
It's not, I mean, now we hear it like, oh, that's just merit. No. In this culture, this was against the grain, against the culture, and they grew together as husband and wife because the Lord was the foundation of their marriage. Before even that, we see in verse 19, the whole turning point of the story. Then the next morning, Elkanah and Hannah got up early to worship before the Lord. It doesn't say Hannah got up early to go worship the Lord. It doesn't say her husband got up to go worship. It said they did this together. They worshiped together. And after that, it changed the whole story. And that's when she became pregnant. That's when they had Samuel, all this stuff, because they d declared holiness over their family, over their marriage. This is the turning point. They declared Jesus, they declared the Lord over their marriage together. And I speak this to our men as well, because it takes two to make this happen. In fact, it should be led by the men as spiritual leaders in the house. But it takes a union. The strongest union you have in your life outside of your unity with God should be the unity with your spouse. There is an incredible force that surrounds a united, God-centered household that the wickedness of this world cannot break down. The moment we open that up and lose our unity and commitment to God is the moment our household becomes vulnerable. That's when it becomes vulnerable, when we, we allow the enemy to come in because we stop declaring our household for the Lord as a couple. And then the third ripple in her life is that she gave her son to the Lord, spiritually and physically. And what I can't imagine is how hard this sacrifice must have been. She was barren, and then this miracle took place in Hannah's life because she gave herself up, she gave her marriage up, and God blessed her and heard her cry. And then she, she had this baby, Samuel, and then now she has to commit to what she did at the beginning. She has to give the, Lord, the baby over to the Lord. And we saw that in chapter 2. Why did she do this? Because she was committed. To, she commit, her commitment drove her to do this. One of the hardest lessons that you have to learn as a parent is that at the end of the day, we truly do not have any control over our children. That's very hard. When I finally, well, I'll say finally, I have two very young children. But when I learned this is when I saw my seven-month-old in a hospital bed hooked up to oxygen for like six days and knowing that I could do nothing to get her out of that. That's when we're like, okay, there's something more to this. I have to trust the Lord and give my baby over to the Lord and trust him rather than trust myself because I'm not doing it. I'm not able to do it. Yes, we, we protect, we teach, we guide, we hope for the best, but ultimately the Lord is in control. And the sooner that you give your family over to the Lord, the better. Hannah's commitment wasn't swayed by convenience or even emotion. Even though she was emotional, she didn't let that drive her. She was committed to the Lord and came through on this commitment. Speaking of rip, ripples, if she did not honor her commitment, what, she, what would she have been teaching her son in that moment? That it's okay to allow your convenience and feelings to dictate your relationship and commitment to the Lord? Right? We have to think about these things. Another sidebar, ripple reflection. A mom's spiritual legacy is credited not only by the difference she makes in her life, but the difference her children make as well. There's a, there's a South African proverb, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the nation and its destiny. A mother's love is special and unique, but a mother's duty to raise her child to, to follow and serve God is a, in a world that encourages you not to is probably the most important responsibility that you have as a mom. The covenant resulted in Samuel being the first prophet and mentoring, eventually mentoring David, who was a serious link in the genealogy of Jesus, right? All because Hannah committed to the Lord. Listen, there might be times that you want to give your kids to the church, just like Hannah did. And I just want to say that was a part of the culture then. Little Country Church does not encourage this. Um, if you have children you want to give away, there's Bethany and Drum would love to take them. But as a church, I uh, would rather not. And there's even times when sometimes our people expect our youth ministry and our children's ministry to fix their kids. There's been many times in my years of youth ministry that somebody come up to me and said, here's the problems, here's the problems, here, please fix them. I'm like, this is not how this thing works, right? 
Hannah devoted her son to the Lord. But she did that after she committed herself to the Lord and her marriage to the Lord. She continued to love her son. Even in chapter 2, we see her coming back. She, so she gave, gave her, her son to Eli to mentor in, in the church. And then she kept going back every year and, and bringing him clothes and encouraging and loving him. And then the Lord eventually ended up blessing her with five more kids. It says a blessing. That's a lot of kids. I don't know if that's a blessing or not. But No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. That... But he ended up, I mean, from someone who didn't have children or couldn't have children to six children in that time is a huge blessing, right? This type of God-centered legacy can ripple through young mothers observing you as well. Not only do you impact your surrounding area or your husband or your wife or your children, but you also have a ripple effect on people who are observing you as a mother and as a father. How do I know this? Even Hannah. So... Hannah is 1100 BC, right? Fast forward to the mother of Jesus, Mary. Uh, We read in chapter 146, we're not going to read it, but there's, it's called Mary's prayer. Then there's a lot of scholars that believe Mary's prayer was actually encouraged by Hannah's prayer. That was 1100 BC. And why is that important? Because her ripples lasted 1100 years. It's pretty incredible that her devotion, her commitment to the Lord has that ripple lasted that long. And I'm not saying that you becoming a good mom will leave ripples in the timeline for 1,100 years, but I'm also not saying that it couldn't because you don't know what the Lord's going to do, right? We can't, we don't know what's going to head ahead of us in the future. We just have today to love our children, to honor them, to give ourselves to the Lord, give our marriage to the Lord. And give our children for the Lord. Josiah, you can go ahead and come up. As we read the story of Hannah, we have to put ourselves in a place and examine our own life. What kind of ripples are we making in this world? While Hannah had a great example of a godly mother, these principles relate to all of us. All of us. As we are committed, are we committed to giving ourselves? You know, Romans 12, 1 through 2, I mean, we read this a lot. Therefore, brothers, I urge you in view of God's mercy, I urge you to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to any of this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Now, this was uh, after Hannah 1,100 years ago, but Hannah's life is all over this, right? Giving of herself sacrificially right honoring him so that she may please God with her life and with her children are we committed to giving our selves to the Lord are we committed to giving our marriage to the Lord listen there's a lot of marriages that are hurting right now it's because we keep trying to fix them ourselves right or we just leave ourselves open because we forgot that God needs to be the foundation of our marriage We are not committed together to honoring God. That's when his protection comes in. That's when his, his, uh, he comes into your marriage and begins to heal wounds that have been there for years that you've been holding on to. Are we committed to giving our marriage to the Lord? Finally, are we committed to giving our children to the Lord? This is so important and valuable. This is, and this is not permission to giving up on your children, but giving up your children to the Lord. I'm not saying give up on them. If they're going through stuff, even as adults, if they're struggling, keep pressing into them in prayer and guidance and love. Right? Say, Lord, I declare victory over my children. I declare victory. And it might not happen right away, but Lord's going to plant a seed that hopefully that your children will grab a hold of and move forward on. But don't give up on them. Give them up to the Lord. But this this is a chain of priorities, though. You can't begin to do that if you don't give yourself to the Lord. Your marriage is going to be a wreck until you commit yourself to the Lord. You've got to commit yourself, then your marriage, and then your children. Your family is a priority, they're your first ministry. But if you haven't committed yourself to the Lord, you're never going to be able to do anything there. It's working backwards. So let's start there. 
and watch God heal the areas of our life that we've been struggling for so long. And maybe you're not married. Maybe you don't have children. But let me tell you, then start on this now. Commit yourself to the Lord, and then he's going to add unto you. Right? It, it was a hard lesson for me as a single guy. I was in Josh's spot. I didn't get married until I was 32, and he's hoping that's not going to take that long for him. But I wasn't hoping either, but the reality is. But I had to come to a place in my life that said, you know what? I'm going to commit myself to the Lord. If God wants to add somebody to my life, then that's going to... She's going to be added to my joy. She's not going to be my joy. And then I committed myself to the Lord, and I said, okay, I'm giving myself. And then, lo and behold, he brought Skylar into my life. And joy just kept adding to my life, and then our children. And it kept, And the more we commit to the Lord, the more he blesses us. The Father favors those who father the fa fa favor the Father. I'm gonna, I was almost there. I almost had it right so let me just pray for us that we begin to do that that families and marriages would be healed that your children if they're older and they're not on the path that you'd like them to go maybe they find their way back but i'm going to pray for you and pray pray for your commitment to the lord because that's where it begins father i do thank you so much for our mothers in the house Thank you. Help them see how valuable and loved that they really are. I pray for all those who have lost their mothers. This is a hard day for them. But let us even celebrate today knowing that they could possibly, hopefully, be in a much better place. And I pray for those who've lost their children. We're constantly reminded of that, especially on this day beautiful thing about your church, especially well, for those who've lost their mothers, they, I, like for me personally, Lord, I see uh, nuggets of my mom and all these other moms you put in my life in the church. And then for those who've lost their children, Lord, you see those nuggets of their children and other people in the church who love them uh, unconditionally. So we thank you for the church and what it is to us and the healing powers that comes. But Father, right now, I pray for each individual in this room that we would be committed to you that we would give ourselves to you. Father, stop holding back. Stop pushing away. Stop trying to do things ourselves. But we finally commit ourselves to you, that we will walk up to you with our arms held high and, and live in such a way that we continue to be submitted to your presence, Father. And then we'll begin to watch the healing take place. Lord, I thank you so much that we can trust you in that, that we can have confidence in your presence. I'll give it up for our pastor. Amen. All right, got a lot to do and a little time to do it. Good word on ripples and big splashes. I just took notes, wrote them down. I love the story of Hannah. God, uh, first nine years of pastoring, there were two days I hated. And I hated them for a reason. I didn't hate them. I didn't look forward to them. One was Mother's Day and the other was Father's Day. Because my wife had no children and I had no children. And of course, many of you know I was arrested three times for protesting against abortion. And I read Hannah and what she did. You got to commit yourself to the Lord whether you get your answer or not. And I did that. And I remember after our first child, Mandy, we got her. We were told we were going to lose her after the first few months we had her. And, uh, that we didn't get all the paperwork right. There's so much legality with the adoption. And uh, I went to see a lawyer, and I was, I was pissed off. I was mad. I was upset. It's my daughter. It's my kid. When we adopted Mandy, the question was, you didn't even ask what color she was going to be. And I said, I didn't care if she's purple and pokey dot. She's going to be my daughter. That lawyer looked at me and he said, son, she ain't your possession. She's your privilege. You know, every now and then you take a rebuke, you need to suck it up and take it. And I sucked it up and I took it. And I realized ever since then, my kids, all five of them, have been my privilege. 
they're not my possession. I do not own them. And there comes a time when I thank God that they are not my possession. Very quickly, let's just take an offering up. Let's take a very good offering. Amen. I want you to be responsible to the Lord. Just like Hannah was when she brought her child, Samuel. You know, I read this, Pastor Joseph, that her commitment to the Lord was this. He'll never have a haircut. <laughs> hey, you long hairs, listen to me. She'll never, he, Samuel, it never even hit me till this. I knew Samson had long hair up to a certain point, but I didn't realize that Samuel never got a haircut. Can you imagine that? No, you can't. Your tithe and offering envelopes are in front of you. We thank you for preparing yourself beforehand. And as we give today, we're believing God for more money, less hours, benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates, and returns, debts to models, royalties, receive favor, success to the kingdom. Amen. One of the things I, I really love doing, and I know some say, well, you do that every year. I know. That's the thing important, to honor our mothers in the house. So if I could get the, the ladies that are helping me right now to deliver these roses. Uh, Josh, I'd like for you to come stand up here with us. Pastor Joseph, I got Josiah up here with me. And the reason I do this, I'm going to tell you why. Mamas, I want all the mamas to stand. He, here's, this is... Pastor Joseph, I want you and Josh, come here. Josiah, you can play in there. I want you to watch this. There's a moment during communion when I get to stand here and I see people that come forward, and it just blesses me to be able to look people in the face and eyes and say, man, I listen. So that, here's the thing that has blessed my heart. You mamas have prayed for us and believed God for us prayed over our kids when our kids were not oh God help us you know and I want to thank you for that so it's important that I know I always get to do this but I want the men to be able to do that those who share it with me in ministry so hey, ladies if you'd come out this way come up amen receive a rose from us let us thank you for being a part of this house the scripture speaks of mamas who pray for ministry you know and she, she had to pray for Eli and all those who were, come on, Mama, get up here, get your rose. They've been dethorned, unlike your children. Oh, I thought the thorns were gone. Oh, they're there, good. Well, good, that'll remind you. Josh about making sure there were no thorns on there, so I would have thought about it. I always thought of that. Natalia, would you come stand with me? Josiah, will you exit the piano and come stand with your beautiful wife? Speaking of marriages, I just so enjoy watching these two in their post. And if I could, if I could stand like Natalia, in a picture. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I got a cramp right then. It just. Oh, <laughs> I saw she graduated and got her bachelor's degree in nursing. 
And when I saw the picture, that leg was up. And I thought, well, she's got a leg up on life, and all of her pictures are that way. Josiah has been in my life, I think, since he was 15. How old are you now? 27. I think he was 18 or 19 when he came to work with us here. He was 20 years old when he came to live here with us. I went to San Antonio. And I remember going and getting him and going to Tip Top Cafe and eating yeah. together and talking about it and saying, you have no choice, your dad said. <laughs> I hauled him back here to the ranch, and he's been such a vital part of my life. Uh, you know, always, I'll always consider him as a son. And uh, so with Natalia's graduation, her commencement, a commencement means you get to start again. To your graduates, you ain't stopped nothing. You didn't graduate. You have to start something now. And that's the crazy thing. You get out of high school and you get into college if you want to go or trade school. And then you start over. Then you, then you get to be a nurse. And then you go back to school to learn a little bit more. And then Josiah got his associate's degree since he's been with us. So this is where we're at, church. And that's why your mamas are all so important. Uh, with Natalia becoming uh, her graduation, she will now become a traveling nurse. By becoming a traveling nurse, they will be relocating at the end of May into another state. So this is not your opportunity to come up and ask any of us, what are we going to do for a worship leader? This is your thing. Will you pray and say, God, send the right next one up to come into this house and work with us. And I'm also giving you a couple of weeks to honor this couple to invite them out to eat, if they can, if you can do that, because they can eat, eat, eat. <laughs> Believe that or not. The next thing is to give them them handshake offerings. You know what I'm saying? Don't be, don't, don't act like, don't get embarrassed, man. Somebody slide a hundred dollar bill in my hand, I'm smiling. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh-huh. Amen. But to honor them and to cherish them, to thank God for them, amen, and appreciate them. So you've got three weeks to do that. So, um, and it, so it just ain't one of them crying moments. You can cry after they're gone, but uh, you can thank God that they were here. Yeah. And they will be back. They will come. They'll be in and out and play, you know, and they always have an extra bedroom. If I don't, I'll kick Josh out and use his house. And, uh, but, but just pray, God, who's, who you got up next, okay? And then thank God for them. This is, a whole, this is about life. This is church and life, but particularly my life is always about bringing people in or sending people out. And the maturity level has uh, is exploded in their lives. They've become extremely mature since they've been here. So, you know, from California to here and how God brought you here. And I'll be honest with you, Natalia, when I first saw you, I thought this puppy didn't have a prayer. <laughs> I thought there ain't no way. And if you don't know this story, I threw him my truck keys and told him to take them back to a hotel. And eight hours later, I got my truck back. And God, re, you not, he didn't read, he just, you put them together. So we thank God. Stretch your hands this way. Father, in the name of Jesus, we lay hands on, we pray for, we thank you for this couple. We thank you that you use them for your glory. We're going to pray over them again in a few weeks, but right now we just want them to know how much we love them and appreciate their impact, their ministry, their gift in this house, how this woman has stood with this man and supported and encouraged him, and vice versa. We thank you, Lord, that these two have literally become one in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. 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 Get out of here before you make me cry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good stuff, hey? Would you stand with me? Mm. All right, all right, all right. It's a good word this morning, ripples. Amen. Everybody good? Amen. Did you dry off, sister? You dried off? Okay, that's good. It's good to have all of you here. Make sure you honor those that need to be honored. Remember, your kids are your privilege. They are not a possession. We do not own them. Thank God for Hannah. Read Hannah's story. Read it all. Read her vow to God. Amen. Read, read what she did. Read about Hophni and Phinehas, the wicked in the, in the temple, and Eli. And, but she brought him in and said, here, and as soon as she gave him up, God blessed her with more kids. And we don't read about their lives and how important they were. But Samuel is the guy 
who went to King David and anointed him as king. He's the man with tremendous giftings in his life. H.C., pray us out here. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you and praise you, Lord. We thank you so much for the message you sent today, Father. And we take advantage of it, Lord. It's right there for us. It's right there in your word for us. We love you. We thank you for... We thank you so much, Father, for your word and for our pastors. We love you and praise you. And we give you glory, and I pray you protect each and every one in this house this morning on their way home. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.